for today's trick, I shall cast a spell. Well, actually, no, but I will cast an agarose gel. So agarose gel electrophoresis is a method we use in order to separate DNA pieces by size by sending them through a gel made up of a mesh of the sugar agarose. And so I'll show you how we make these gels. It's super duper easy. But first, here's a look at what's actually going on. So basically, agarose is a sugar, and it's made up of these long chains of this repeating disaccharide, so two like sugar unit um, molecules called agarobios, that disaccharide, and then you have a chain of about 400 of those. So you have about 800 of these individual sugar units in a chain, and that's what we have in agarose. Now, each of these sugar units, it has these kind of like parts sticking off these like legs that have the hydroxyl groups. And so hydroxyl, and that's an OH group. And why this matters is because these have the ability to form hydrogen bonds. And so we call them bonds, but they're not bonds like the bonds holding together the sugars in this chain. Instead, they're more just like attractions. So they're partial charge, partial charge attractions, but they're significant. These are the same type of bonds that hold the strands of DNA together and that do things like make water are sticky and so it happens because the oxygen is like electronegative and it pulls some of the electrons away from the hydrogen making them their true bonds are um, kind of like polar so you have this partial charge imbalance and much more on that in other posts but if you don't want to worry about that for now don't worry about it for now just know that the hydroxyl group is going to make it sticky both to itself and to water and so what happens then is that when you have it in this solid form, all it has to hang out with is itself. And so you kind of have it all just clumped up. What we're going to do is we're going to dissolve it in our buffer. And so our buffer is going to be mostly water and also some salts and stuff. What happens is that when we dissolve something, we coat it in a full coat of solvent, in this case water. So each of those strands is going to get coated in water and this is going to free it up from the other strands. And once it's freed up, it's going to be able to wiggle around too because we're going to add heat. We're dissolve when we dissolve it, we need to kind of unstick them from one another. And so we dissolve them when we just add the, put them in the buffer, we also microwave it. And this is going to get them to come apart from one another. It's going to get them coated in the water instead, and it's going to give them energy. So it gave them energy to break free from one another. And now they have some energy that they can use to wiggle around because heat, this is just energy. And when molecules have energy, they're going to move around. And so they're going to move around unless they're tied to other molecules and that's going to make things harder. So if they get stuck to other molecules, it's going to be harder to get free and they're going to have to have extra energy in order to break off those reactions before they can go wiggle around a little. So if we start removing that heat, if the things cool down, well now what's going to happen is that if they bump into something that they like sticking to, they're going to get stuck and they might not have the energy in order to unstick. If it's just an interaction that's not that favorable, um, if it's just like a transient bump um, to something that it doesn't really like that much, no big deal. It can still go wiggle around free. But if it binds, it's just randomly moving around and it binds to something that it really likes, it's attracted to, well now it's going to be harder to break free. So as an end result, what's happening is that the molecules are going to find their kind of like ideal partner. If you want to simplify it, you can kind of think about it like, ah, we're running out of energy so we might we might as well get stuck to something that we like. But in reality, it's just like, well, it's harder to unstick from those things if we like if we happen to bump into them. And so the sugar, um, what's gonna happen is that because of the shape of the sugar and some of its like awkward little legs, um, it's going to make it so that when these sugars, um, when two chains meet one another, they're go their most optimal like conformation, so their shape is going to be this sort of like anti-parallel helix. Um, and so they're gonna go from being move moving around in these kind of like random coils to forming these helixes where you have one strand in one direction and one strand in the other direction. So kind of like DNA where you have an anti-parallel helix but in this case it's going to be a left-handed helix instead of a right-handed helix these helixes um basically they're then going to once you cool down the energy even further you remove the energy you remove energy um, by cooling things down well now what's going to happen is those helixes are going to start bundling bunching up into these like super coils you get like multiple of these helixes kind of hanging out together 
And if you take even more energy away, well, now those are going to start bumping into other um, of those bundles and they're going to get stuck to one another, especially at their like frayed ends. And so as an end result, you're going to end up having this like mesh like network and it's all going to be filled with water because remember the water also likes to hang out with it. So most of our gel is actually going to be water. And so it's going to have all these holes filled with water and the size of those holes is going to depend on how much of the agarose we started with. So if we start with a high percentage, um, so we'll talk more about the percentage, but it's a weight volume. So it would be like one percentage would be a gram per hundred mils, which is commonly used. Um, then you're going to have, um, a certain whole size. If you add more agarose, you have a higher percentage, you're going to get a finer mesh, smaller holes, which is going to be good for separating smaller pieces of DNA. And if you have a looser mesh, um, so you start with a lower percentage, that's going to be good for separating bigger pieces of DNA. And much more on how all the electrophoresis part works in another post. But for now, just know that you can change the percentage, you can change the amount of the agarose you add in order to change the meshiness of the gel. And so we're going to now go make our gel. We're going to dissolve our agarose. So we're going to mix our agarose um, with our buffer and microwave it. And this is going to give it the heat it needs to break free from one another. Um, you can kind of think about it as having a ball of yarn that's all tangled up and you're going to untangle the yarn. And then what you're going to do is you're going to let it cool. Um, so it takes, it goes to about like 40 degrees Celsius before it gelifies. Um, so it starts hardening. And before it starts hardening, we're going to pour it into our gel. What's going to happen is that it's going to start gelifying. Those individual um, agrobios chains are going to kind of knit themselves together into this mesh, going back to that yarn analogy. And at the end of the day, well, at, after like 15 minutes, you'll have an agarose gel that you can then go run and analyze your results. You want to choose a percentage that is going to be ideal for the fragment size that you're looking for. 1% is typically common where 1% is it's a weight volume percentage. So 1% is one gram per 100 mils. If you're doing one of the big gels, the 100 mils will do. Um, but for these little gels, you only need 50. So if I want a 1% gel, I can weigh out um, 0.5 grams of agarose and then I will dissolve it in 50 mils of my buffer. Um, so I'm using a TAE buffer. Some people use a TPE buffer. Both will work. Um, I'm using TAE. Um, so we also need an Erlenmeyer flask. So basically just pour in your buffer and then pour in your agarose. And now you're gonna go and you're gonna take it to the microwave. I typically microwave it in like 45 or so second spurts and keep an eye on it so that it doesn't boil over because if it boils over, you're gonna lose some and you're also gonna have to clean up the microwave, which isn't fun. So basically, um, I typically just do like the express cook. It's easiest to do it for a minute and then just stop it a little before and especially stop it if it starts bubbling. Um, you definitely wanna make sure you don't burn yourself. Um, so use like these rubber glove type things if you don't have one of these. Um, you can just like fold a paper towel over and use that. Um, just make sure you don't burn yourself, people. And then during, in between the spurts, just go ahead and swirl it a little um, and see how it's dissolved. So you want it to be boiling, but you don't want it to boil over. And you want to make sure that you can't see any of the agarose particles anymore. We want to make sure that they each have that full water coat. And when it, when it comes out, you're going to want to let it cool for a couple minutes. You could pour it right away, but that could warp the comb. And also, if you're going to add the stain to the de to the um, to your gel at the before you cast it, you're going to want to basically let it cool so that that doesn't all just vaporize. Depending on what type of stain you're using, um, I typically use this Easy Vision stain, which basically you put it in the it's in the loading buffer. The stain is so you don't have to worry about putting it in your gel. But putting it in the gel is much easier than if you were to then post stain the gel. When it's cooling is a good time. You can be setting up your gel, um, like the cast the or set up the gel apparatus. So a cheaper way is to just tape the edges of your cassette. But if you have one of these trays, um, this makes life a lot easier. And so basically, these trays are just going to take the place of that tape. 
tape on here is just so you can see where things are. But you can just slide this into the cassette. It's hard to do it one-handed. Um, and then this tightens in order to basically make it so that this is going to get stuck. And don't overturn it or else it's gonna um, undo itself. Now, you also, you wanna make sure things are level. They have these like knobs that you can use to adjust the height. Um, so just make sure things are level. And then choose a comb size, depending on how many wells you have or how many samples you have to run. So I'm just gonna use um, this one, which has eight wells. I only have four samples, so this should be fine. Um, there's these little notches in the side that you can then place your comb in nice. Um, and just make sure that it's evenly put in and that your thing is even so that your gel, when you cast it, is going to be, um, is going to be level and all the wells are going to be in a line and not like at a crooked angle or something because then things will look really weird. So remember, it's going to start jellifying at about 40 degrees Celsius. And so we don't want it to get to that point, but we want it to get the point where we can actually hold this without needing the gloves before we can pour it. Once it gets to that point, we can now pour it in. Now, some people put the comb in after they pour it, um, and if that if you do that, um, that works too. But whatever, either way, you want to make sure that you don't have any bubbles around it. You also want to make sure that you don't have any bubbles anywhere else. If you do, you can just take a pipette and kind of push them aside. One way you might have bubbles is if you kind of like overshake this. So when you, if you're adding the stain, so if you're adding something like a cyber stain to the to that gel after you melt it and let it cool a little, and then you have to mix it to make sure that's thoroughly mixed, but you don't wanna be introducing bubbles when you mix that, so just gently swirl it. Um, and then you're going to pour it in. You can see things look pretty clearish. Um, so this is all just a, a, like a clear layer. And what's going to happen is that when we come back in like 10 minutes or so, that's going to be all foggy, telling us that the gel has solidified. If we want things to solidify quicker, we can take away the heat quicker, such as by sticking this in the fridge or in the cold room. And if we want things a lot, lot faster, or not a lot, lot faster, but if we're in a really big hurry, um, what we can do is we can actually stick the cassette, so this plastic thing, into the fridge before we're ready to run the gel, um, before we're ready to pour the gel, and then it'll be pre-cooled and help things go even faster. But I'm not in that big of a hurry because I still need to go run my PCR. So you can see it's now all solidy looking and it's like foggy looking. Um, this one is a 2%, so you can see it's a little bit, uh, the fog is denser. <laughs> now it's go time. Uh, they're satisfying bubbles. <laughs> 